bumper? No bumper. Yeah, do the bump, 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 bump. Oh, can you start the recording? Yes. Sure. I'll like the The kingdom of God is as multifaceted and mysterious as our creator. A kingdom we only see now through a glass, darkly. Though we can't picture it fully, God's kingdom is the story told in scripture, from the garden to the city. And in the middle of the story, God chose to reveal his kingdom in a new way. The gospel is not only Jesus coming and dying to save us from our sins, it's also the story of God establishing his dwelling, dominion, and dynasty in the world. We live as far as citizens and strangers, prisoners of hope in this shadow kingdom, all while knowing it's not our true home, that something better is coming, that God's perfect kingdom is coming. Citizens and strangers, thank you guys. It's, it's cool. What are that, one of my, I, I told everyone the best gift I can get is the fact that I get to preach on my birthday. Yeah. I'm super excited. Oh, glory to God with you guys. Um, there's really, I'll, I'll spend some birthday with them because I can with Nikki and you might. Um, the most important habit that you can establish in your life is reading and studying this book, mining it for all it's worth. This series is the product of deep study. It's the product of spending time in God's word, not just reading the stories for like principles or, or for laws or ideas, but reading to see what is God saying through this book. Every time you open the pages of the Bible, God has a message that he is trying to communicate to you through these biblical authors. And I would just encourage you, when you're in your Bible, read it for all it's worth. Dig in. Try to find the greater themes. It's so easy to read Matthew 5, which is where we're going to be tonight. You can turn there in your Bibles. It's so easy to read Matthew 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. It's easy to read this and think of it as a law code. It's easy to read this passage of scripture and think of it as, this is just, if you want to have a good life, do these things and it's going to go good for you. And, and that is what it's saying, but there's something deeper going on here. Jesus is giving deeper messages. The author of Matthew, Matthew has had, he, he's had years to reflect on the teachings of Jesus. This is a guy who worked and lived with Jesus for three and a half years. He's alongside him, living with him, seeing everything he did. And he, at the end of it, towards the end of his life, he writes this gospel, not as just a record of a biography of Jesus, but, but he writes this telling us, here's what the story of Jesus means. There are deep things going on in Matthew. So I would just encourage you, as you're studying your Bible, this is just a freebie. As you're studying, as you're reading, read and try to find what are the deep things that are going on in this text. The Bible is written by smart people who are trying to do something. I just give you that for free. We're talking the book of Matthew, chapter 5. You can turn there. We won't read it next. I'll give you some time. To find it, we've been traced the story of the kingdom of God. We are citizens of God's kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world. We are strangers in our world. And, and this is a huge deal for us today, as we are pulled from every direction. We have all, all of the world is pulling us to be citizens of the world. Whether you go to politics, whether you go to culture, whether you go to the media, wherever you're going to go, the world is just pulling you to, to be something, to become a citizen of a political party, a citizen of a cultural movement, a citizen of a platform of social media. The, the world is just bugging you and begging you, come be a part of us, join our tribe. We live in a culture and a time when tribalism is more prevalent than ever. And Jesus is calling us to reject all those things, to, to reject the, the patterns of this world to reject the kingdoms of this world and to recognize that we are citizens of a different kingdom. We're citizens of a bigger kingdom. We've been talking about the kingdom of God in this series. And, and I just want to push this out again and again and again. The kingdom of God is God's rule on earth. So as we talk about the kingdom of God in the book of Matthew, as we talk about what the kingdom of God looks like now over the next few weeks, we, we need to remember the kingdom of God is not a spiritual place. The kingdom of God is, is not some ethereal kind of in the clouds area that we're going to go to when we die. The kingdom of God, and, and listen to me when I say this, if you get nothing else out of this series, this alone will change your view on scripture, it will change your view on what your role is in the world. The kingdom of God is God's rule and reign established on the earth through his people. I'll say that again. God's kingdom is his rule and his reign established on the earth through his people. So if you get nothing else, that is, that's what we live for. That, that's what we're trying to bring about. We're not living for some spiritual existence when we die. We're living for the here and now. We're living for today. We're, we're, we're living for 
making God more and more beautiful and awesome on this world. That's, that's why we say every week, Jesus, you are better than anything in this world. We're reminding ourselves, we want to see Jesus in this earth. And all the things the world tries to throw at us are poor substitutes for who Jesus is. And if we can lock into Jesus, if we can lock into bringing Jesus into our world, we will, we will find satisfaction, we will find true joy, we will find true happiness. So we've been tracing this theme, the kingdom of God. We've been tracing it through scripture. We started in Genesis with the garden, which was the picture of God's kingdom established on earth. And mankind placed in this garden as, as rulers of the kingdom. Uh, ultimately, they, their job is to turn the entire world into this garden paradise. And this is still our job today. As we interact with the world, we're bringing the rule of God into every facet of life. We're turning the world into this paradise where God rules and reigns and his presence is experienced and felt, ultimately, mankind failed in this endeavor. They, they, they unleashed sin into this world by breaking the, the covenant that, that God had made with them, by breaking the rules that God had set, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, believing lies about themselves and their role in the world. Devastation, sin, and the world. And now we see its effects, right? We live in a broken world. We see the effects with, with poverty. We see the effects with racism. We see the effects with abortion. We see the effects of all these different areas. And sin has infected and, and messed everything up in our world. But luckily, we're not stuck in this world. Jesus has come. And God has worked through history. Last week, we, or two weeks ago, we traced the history of God working through a man called Abraham, through his family called Israel, through a king named David. And we see that God has just been working through history to return things to the way they are. That God does not want us to live in a sinful world. God doesn't want us to live in this brokenness. That the goal of that God's goal for the earth is that we return to this paradise. We return to what is the kingdom of God. And Jesus, the son of David, shows up. He's announcing he's bringing the kingdom of God. And we are citizens of this kingdom. We're citizens of the rule of God established on the earth. And we have the same job. We have the same job and the same goal. As we live as citizens of this kingdom, we are creating paradise on the earth. Everywhere we walk, everywhere we, we, we work, everywhere we live, the friends that you interact with, they, they are all placed in your life by God so that you can bring His kingdom into their lives. So you can bring peace into their lives. So you can bring joy into their lives. Everywhere you go in your school, everywhere you go in your classes, you have a job. Your job is I'm bringing the kingdom of God with me as I walk everywhere I go. And over the next few weeks now as we study the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, we're going to learn how we're going to do that. And so tonight, I'm going to give you my, my thesis, because I, I'm kind of, I think this way, I'm going to give you my main point. You can fill this in. Jesus' followers will be unique in their world, marked by high moral character that in turn exerts influence on the world around them. Jesus' followers will be unique in their world. Marked by high moral character that in turn exerts influence on the world around them. We're going to talk about character and influence. We get to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus has begun his ministry. And Matthew presents this as the first big teaching of Jesus. Last week, Pastor Gabe asked us, when are we going to hear the state of the union for the kingdom of God? Well, this is, what, this is the state of the union of God's kingdom. This is God giving, here's, here's the policies for the kingdom. And here's how members of the kingdom are going to look. Here's what the kingdom of God is going to look on the earth. So as, as, as Jesus preaches Matthew 5, a couple of things I just want to point out to you. This is all a single message. So over the next, I think it's five weeks, that so we're just going to break down Matthew 5 through 7. And we want you to be able to read this text and understand what's going on. That you're not just confused by the Bible, but that it makes sense to you. But over the next few weeks, this is all one long sermon that Jesus is preaching. So what, what we're going to have a temptation to do, what we are always tempted to do when we read the Bible, we, we are tempted to break the Bible up into chunks, in a, in a manageable size, and say, well, here's what God's saying here, and now here's what Jesus is saying here, and now here's what Jesus is saying here. And we have a tendency to kind of break things apart, but what I want you to do, what I want you to keep in mind over the next few weeks, this is all one long story. This is all one long sermon with one main point. So we're going we're gonna to apply this in different ways. We're going to do some different things. But don't get lost in all the, in all the breaking. But Jesus has one message that he wants us to get. Here, here, here's what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is reframing the kingdom and its citizens and recapturing the vision of creation from its current misunderstandings. So Jesus is preaching in a culture. He's preaching in a time and a place. And he's preaching to a certain people. As Jesus preaches this message, he's preaching to his disciples. 
He's preaching to a crowd of non-believers. He is confronting the beliefs and ideas of his day and age. He's confronting Pharisees who have set this high idea that you must live by every single aspect and facet of the law if you want to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus is confronting this idea and replacing it with, with a new one, a vision that the kingdom of God is open to all who will come. Jesus says this again and again and again throughout his ministry. All who come to me, I will take and I will turn anyone away. He says this in a culture and a time where you have to reach a certain status to enter the kingdom of God. You have to be good enough. You have to be born into the right family. You have to have the right connections. And Jesus says, no, this is for everyone. So he's reframing what the kingdom of God is. We, here's, here's why we need this today. We live in a world that tells us the kingdom of God looks a certain way. We live in a world that says that the church is supposed to be and do an act in, in a certain prescribed cultural way. And if we step outside those lines, well, hold on, hold on. You just need to go to church and do your religious thing. But the kingdom of God is bigger than that. And, and, and the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God is meant to do, it's meant to grow and expand into all the earth. This is what Pastor Gabe reminded us of last week. That the kingdom of God starts small and it gets bigger and, and, and it just invests and infects the entire world. The power of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God makes its way to every facet of life. And so we don't have this strange separation of church and state. We don't have some strange idea where I'm a Christian on Wednesdays and Sundays and then I live differently through, throughout the rest of my life. Or I do my Jesus thing in church, but, but that stays in church. Keep your faith to yourself. That is not the kingdom of God. Right. Jesus is reframing this. So this is why we need to hear this today. Because the kingdom of God needs to infect every part of the world. Jesus' followers are going to be unique in their world, marked by a high moral character that in turn exerts influence on the world around them. Here's my first point. Citizens of the kingdom reflect the character of the king. Citizens of the kingdom reflect the character of the king. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll start reading. And as we're reading, I'm just going to kind of talk through. I'm not going to have time to give you the full exegesis and breakdown of all these points. There are literally 500 page books written just on these 16 verses. We can't do that tonight. I wish I could, but I can't. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to give you some talking points. And what I want to do as I talk through this, I want to just get you ready to launch in your groups and discuss these in more depth and detail. I want to get you ready for Starbucks tonight. FYI, every Wednesday, almost, we're at Starbucks. Everyone's invited and welcome. Marino Beach, if you want to come hang out, talk through stuff, you can do that. So I just want to prepare you for some conversations in your small groups. I want to prepare you to be able to discuss this stuff a week with your friends, with your family. So I, I can't touch everything, but I'm going to do the best that I can to help us understand what's going on here. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he, he being Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came in, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so is persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're going to stop there and pick up again later. Jesus tells us that citizens of the kingdom will reflect the character of the king. Here's what's happening. Jesus is giving a list of character traits. He's saying, if you're part of the kingdom, this is what your life is going to look like. This is what your heart is going to look like. You're going to be marked by all these different things. You're, you're, you're going to be marked by being poor in spirit, by being mournful, you're, by, by being meek, by hungering for righteousness. So, so what I want to do with you in just a few minutes is break this down kind of line by line, talk about what these things mean. So, so first thing, we're told that the citizens of the kingdom are going to be blessed. What, what is this talking about? The word blessed. This is actually a word that we trace all the way back to the Old Testament, and we, we could spend plenty of time going through and getting the, the word history. We won't do that now. But here, here's the idea. The, the idea of being blessed is it's the peace and security that comes from right relationship with God in response to Jesus' teaching. The idea here is that a blessed person is the person who listens to what Jesus does and then goes and does it. And if you listen to what Jesus says 
and then you go and do what he tells you to do, you are going to experience peace and security in your heart and in your relationship with God. This is what it means to be blessed. So, so sometimes I'm blessed and highly favored. This is what they ought to be meaning. I am in a right relationship with God. I, I know that I am doing what God has called me to do. I am living in God's will. This is what it is to be blessed. It's to be in a right relationship with God because you're doing what he tells you to do. And as, as Jesus lists these things, he is, he, he's building, he's building kind of almost, he's building a tower from the ground up. So you can think of this as kind of a layer after layer after layer. And all these things build on top of each other. The first thing he says, someone in the kingdom of God is going to be poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Here, here, here's what this looks like. The, the kingdom of God is not one in which you have to first get your life together before you can approach the king. God is not looking for perfect people. If he was, he wouldn't have anyone. There aren't any. We don't, they, they don't exist. The only perfect man was Jesus. And, and they killed him so that we could be perfect. In, but, but, but through him, we're not going to be perfect people on our own. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. If you are waiting to approach God until you have your life together, you will never get there. If you think that God is waiting for you to just stop sinning before he's going to love you, you'll never get there. Listen to me. God will never love you any more than he does right now in this moment. And in the middle of your deepest and darkest sin, God will never love you any more or any less than he does right here in this moment. We know what true love is because Jesus gave his life for us. First John 4, 9. God will never love you any more or any less than he does right here and right now. The kingdom of God is not one in which you must be perfect to get in. The kingdom of God is made up not of the strong, but of the weak and the hurting. Are you in this place not hurting? Are you feeling broken in spirit? Are you feeling like you are unworthy? Good, the kingdom of God is for you. The kingdom of God is for you. It's open to you. God came for you. Are you in this place feeling like you have it all together? Are you in this place feeling like, man, I've got this. I'm good. Jesus will tell you, you're not as close as you think you are. The kingdom of God is not for perfect people. The kingdom of God is not for people who feel like their lives are together. The kingdom of God is for the broken, the hurting, the empty, the hopeless. See, see God's people are people who mourn. Bless those who mourn, they should come for me. God's people are marked by a brokenness over brokenness. We see that the world is not as it should be. We see that, we see that all is not right in this world, this breaks our heart. We see that in our, in our own lives, we are not who we ought to be. Our lives are not as good as they need to be, and we mourn over that. It hurts. I don't know if you felt this in your heart and in your life, but you look inside yourself and say, man, there's something wrong with me. There's something deep down inside that I cannot fix and cannot change. I, I, I just mourn that. The kingdom of God is for you. Jesus' followers are people who mourn the sin in their life. They mourn the fact that there's something wrong with them. But, but we, don't just, we don't just mourn ourselves. We mourn the state of the world. We look at systems in the world. We say, man, sin has messed everything up. Sin has pervaded itself throughout our whole world. And then the whole world is broken. God's people are people who mourn over, over brokenness in the world. We mourn over systems of injustice. We mourn over areas in society where, where people are abused and broken. We mourn over places where the poor are oppressed. We mourn over, we mourn over the state of abortion in our world where, where innocent babies are, are, are killed because of someone else's poor decisions. Christians look at the world and they mourn. But, but, but God's people are, are not just ones who, who mourn. We, we also seek to do something about sin. We seek to put it to death. We seek to confront sin in the world around us. True mourning it is marked by an attitude of trying to improve things and, and, and make them better than they are. True mourning says, I'm not satisfied with the brokenness of the world. I want to do something about it. I want to fix it. This is what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. But as we mourn sin, as we are broken about it, as we seek to fix things, we, we, we do this with meekness. Bless the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The idea of meekness, I love the way Pastor Dave defines it. He says, meekness is power under control. Saying, I could destroy you and devastate you, 
but I won't. As God's people confront sin, and as we call out sin in our world, which is we're called to do, we mourn sin and we say, hey, there, there, this is not right. Babies are getting killed every day. There's something wrong here. The poor are being oppressed, and there's something wrong with that. Justice is not being done to every race, color, and creed. And there's something wrong with that. But we don't do that with arrogance. We don't do that seeking to beat people over the head with our truth. We do that with meekness. We do that with power under control. We don't rejoice in exposing sinners. We call out sin, but when we do it, we do it in humility. God's kingdom doesn't expand through winning debates or having the best theology or apologetics. It expands through acts of justice and mercy. We expand God's kingdom by humbly and quietly doing what we can to set things right in the world. We mourn sin, and then we do something about it to fix it. And, and, and this is what Jesus says, the, the very next thing, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that they should be satisfied. Bless you and hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be satisfied. God's people act to put things right in the world. You cannot separate the idea of righteousness from justice. The two related words, and we don't have time to go down this rabbit hole, someday you can look up Mishpat and Sedeq, two Hebrew words, and they're closely related, justice and righteousness. Righteousness happens when the justice of God is enacted in the world. Righteousness happens when the justice of God is enacted in the world. Right relationships among all things in the created order of things. So people who hunger and thirst for righteousness are people who hunger and thirst and seek to see justice done in the world. We seek to see abortion end. We seek to see oppression end. We seek to see poverty alleviated. We seek to see broken things restored and put back together. Citizens of the kingdom see the broken state of the world and are dissatisfied. We're hungry for justice. We, we thirst for righteousness. We won't be satisfied until we see it. We work towards it actively. We're, we're not just satisfied saying, man, the world sucks and man, I want to see it better. But we're hungry. We're actively seeking to see things made right in, in our relationship with each other. And as you have a relationship with your friend and your family, you're seeking to have right relationships. So, so, so when there's something between you and a friend, you, you don't just say, man, that sucks. We can't be friends anymore. But you seek to make things right. When, when, when you see injustice done in your school, when, when you see bullying happening, when, when, when you see people treated unfairly, we, we don't turn a blind eye to those things, but we actively seek to see the right thing done. But justice and mercy go hand in hand. Blessed are those, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Justice and mercy go hand in hand. We, we need to hear this today. In a culture captivated by the question of what it means to have social justice, we need to also consider social mercy. And, and this is the rule of our politics right now. And it, it is right to seek justice. It is right that we are concerned about the right thing being done. But, but only as long as we also seek mercy. We seek mercy for even, even the people who are at fault and are, are, are wrong. They need mercy too. Perfect people don't need mercy. We want to live in peace with them. 
We, we are not Machiavellian rulers establishing God's kingdom through power structures or, or control and fear. Rather, we're Mother Teresa's, we're Martin Luther King Jr.'s, we're, we're Jim Elliott's laying down our lives for the sake of our message. We embody Jesus who hung on the cross for a gospel of peace. As we, as we seek to see things made right in our world, as, as we work for righteousness, as we work for justice, we do this peacefully. Yeah. Not, not beating people over the head with our Bible, but seeking to live in peace and harmony, seeking dialogue with each other. The last thing, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you live differently, you'll be treated differently. If you live differently, you'll be treated differently. Yeah. But, but this is a blessing. It's not a curse. We, we rejoice because there's a reward coming. Not, not necessarily a physical one, but there's a spiritual reward coming. When you live differently, when you embody this, you should expect some pushback. You, you, you should expect that not everyone's going to understand why you're at church every Wednesday night. Not everyone's going to understand why you're having mercy on people. Not everyone's going to understand why. That kid's weird. We should make fun of him. Not everyone's going to understand when you push back against that. Right? It's, it's not going to make sense to everyone. But, but you'd expect that. And, and when we get pushed up, when we're, when we're persecuted, and that's not even real persecution. There, there, there's people who, who, who have lost families over the message of Jesus. And, and when we rejoice in that, we embrace that. And despite the pain, despite the fact that it hurts, there's a blessing coming. There's a blessing in that. We are blessed. You're not the first to be persecuted, nor will you be the last. You're in good company. If you're not being opposed by someone, you're not doing anything of significance. If no one's pushed back against you, you aren't doing anything. Sure. So, so, I wish I could go more in depth on all these things, but, but your job, here's, here's, if I can sum it up all onto one statement, your job as a follower of Jesus has not changed from the beginning of time. Your, your job is to reflect the image of God in the world around you, making the world look more like heaven and making others look more like God. All these things, all these character traits, they build on one another with the end goal of, I want to represent God to other people. I want to represent Jesus to the people around me. I want to live the way that he does. My last point as we wrap it up. The kingdom of God expands through you. The kingdom of God expands through you. Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The kingdom of God expands through you. Jesus' followers will have an influence on the world around them. Your goal and your responsibility is not just to do your Christian thing and not interfere with anyone else's life. The calling that God has placed on your life is to interfere with everyone's life. Not, not through aggressive kind of rude behavior and, and being a jerk about it, but just through living like Jesus, loving like Jesus, embodying the character of Jesus. And as you do this, the world around you is going to change. Right. You are going to live as salt in this world. You're going to live as light in this world. Jesus makes two comparisons that his followers will embody. He says that you are salt. You are salt. What does salt do? When you put salt in a dish, you taste it. When, 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 I, I love to bake. I love, I love to, to, to make cookies and stuff. I, I was making some cookies the other week, and, and I forgot to put in the salt. I forgot to put in the salt. I baked them. I, I, I finished them. I bit into one of them. It was nasty. I had to throw the whole batch away. Because they didn't have the salt. When salt is missing, when, when salt is missing, there's something wrong. We need salt in our world. We need you in the world being salt. We need you flavoring the things around. You know when salt is there. You know when salt isn't there. A, a, a well-seasoned a well -seasoned piece of meat is incredible to eat. A piece of meat without any seasoning is bland and disgusting. I was at a Mongolian barbecue two days ago, and they did not season their meat. It was so gross. It was, it was a waste of money. It was a waste of time. They didn't season the meat. And it was worthless. It was no good. The world and, and your life and your world is worthless without you. Right. We, we need salt. We need to taste you. 
We need to know that you're there. You need to make yourself known. Imagine fries without salt. In and out. Right? We need you in the world. Salt works its way through. Do people taste you when you're in the room? Do people know you're there? What, what do people taste when, when you're having conversations? Is, is it tasty? That's good. Do people enjoy talking with you and being around you? Do the conversations that you have with other people build them up or tear them down? As you're interacting and having, having just life in your school, do, do people around you see you and say, man, I want to be more like Josiah? Yes. yes. Or, or do they look at you and say, man, uh, who am I going to pick on? Ramiro. Yeah. Man. <laughs> I, I hang out with Ramiro and I just come away feeling so just bad. I feel bad about myself afterwards. Not true. Not true. What, what, what's people's response? When they spend time with you. Right. Are you being salt or have you lost your taste? And Jesus would encourage you, don't lose your taste. Right. Don't lose your taste. Salt that isn't salty, it isn't good for anything except to be thrown away and trampled on your foot. Don't lose your taste. Jesus says you're also light. You're also light in the world. You, you, you're affecting the world around you, but, but, but you're also functioning as light. What does light do? Light exposes darkness. Light pushes back darkness. Your calling as a Christian is to push back darkness in the world around you. To push back evil. To push back dark things and bad things. And so when you're in conversations, you're not just there, but you are actively working against the forces of evil. We, 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 live in, we live in an unspiritual culture. We live in a culture that's pretended that demons and devils don't exist and we don't have to worry about them. Let me tell you, that, that, that is a false paradigm. It's a false view of the world. There are evil forces in your world, but, but, but we don't think about that and freak out. We think about saying, man, I have an opportunity and I have a responsibility to push back against those things. The Bible says our fight is not against flesh and blood, it's against the evil principalities and spiritual authorities in the heavenly realm. But, but, but these, are not, these are not scary, dark demons that are, are going to chop your head off or something, but, but rather, they're scared of you. Darkness is scared of light. When you turn on a light, the, the darkness doesn't fight with it, right? The, there's no fight of like, man, is it, it like some light comes and it goes back and it goes, light just comes, it's on, and the darkness is gone. This is your effect in the world. That you need to be light, pushing back darkness, exposing darkness, exposing works of evil. Not through confrontation, but through contrast. You, you don't have to fight for it, you, you just, you're there. You turn on the light and speak truth. You exist as light. People see your good works and they glorify your Father. They see that you embody the character of Jesus, that, that your character looks different than the world around you. You turn the light on. People see you. People notice you. Like guides others. Where are you guiding people in your life? If people were to follow you, would they end up closer to Jesus or further from them? Think about that in, in your groups. Answer that question. If people were to follow you, would they be closer to Jesus or further from him? Good question. I, I can't answer that for you, but you need to consider that. Where are you leading people? Because you are light. Yeah. Jesus doesn't say you're going to become light, or you, or you need to try to be like light. He says you are the light of the world. Right. You are. So where are you leading people? Don't hide your light. Don't hide your life. You have an opportunity to lead people. So lead them. Walk into it. And the last thing here, you is plural. You is plural. So, so we have a problem in English, right? If I say you, I'm either talking to you, or I'm talking to all of you. Right. Um, we, don't, we don't have this distinction in, in the English language. But what Jesus is doing here, he's talking to all of you. So he's saying you all are salt. You all are light. So, so here's what that means. The pressure is off you. You don't have to do it all yourself. But we all have to do it. We have to embody together. So, so in a way, the pressure is even greater. Because if you fail, we all fail. Right. right? So the pressure's on, the pressure's off. It's not all on you. If you try to act as, I'm the only one who can do this, and I have to do it all myself, you are going to work yourself to death. If you try to be the salt of the world all on your own, you, you're, you're going to be an insufferable moralist. That's all that's going to happen. No one's going to like you. Because you're going to be so focused on, man, I just have to, I have to always, I have to always lay down a letter of life. I have to always just, but, but no, you just live. And if we all live in this way, if
If every single one of you were to show up at school tomorrow and begin living differently, imagine what your school would look like. If everyone at Valley View were to walk onto their campus and begin living and embodying the character of Jesus, imagine what would happen on that campus. And you aren't the only followers of Jesus there. On every campus, there are people who follow Jesus. There are people who, who are part of a youth group and attend church. Imagine what would happen if Trademark, if, if, if Discovery's youth group, if, if Paul Canyon's youth group, if, if all these different youth groups throughout, through, through, throughout our city begin to live like Jesus, imagine what that would look like in our world. Imagine if we all would just turn the light on. Imagine what people would find. If we can embody this, we will change the world around us. So I want to give you that big vision. I want to send you to groups and to, to talk about this stuff to flesh out further. In about 10 minutes, I'm sorry leaders, I did not give you enough time. But we're going to do what we can. We're going to try to talk to you and have some real conversations. 8.15, let's pray real quick and then go to groups. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for... for for the example that you give us there, that you call us to a high example. You call us to a high standard. But Jesus, we thank you that we can embody this. We can live in this. You've given us the power to do this. I pray that, that we would be people of high character, that, that through our character we would influence the world around us, that we, we would see our world change through us. Would you give us the heart and passion to do it? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus you, are you are better, better than, anything than anything in this world. In 